Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 92, Science Faction Uranium. Uranium, of course, is used to power nuclear weapons and nuclear reactors. Depleted uranium, which is only weakly radioactive, is used for artillery rounds and armor, as it's 70% more dense than lead. Uh, it's also used to be used to color glass yellow, as far back as the Roman Empire, and to develop photographs. You probably have heard of a Sabo round if you've seen the first Transformer movie, uh, where they basically say that a high-velocity round fired out of a shoulder-mounted weapon will not remove the shoulder of the person firing it. That's just good science. What does that have to do with uranium? Sable rounds are made of depleted uranium. Oh, okay. If you ever see a tank fire, they're firing depleted uranium rounds. Uh, very see. interesting yeah. story. Uranium, like I said, has been used in nuclear reactors. Uh, and a weird product of this world that we live in and the universe that we live in is that in 1972, a French physicist, Francis Perrin, he discovered what he thought was evidence of somebody trying to operate a nuclear reactor in Gabon, <laughs> West Africa. He went out to this place called Oklo Mine, and he found a bunch of uranium, and the ratio of uranium seemed to indicate that this had been going through basically the same process as a nuclear power plant for a long time. And the, the remains, the ratio of it, indicated that this had gone on. And he was wondering, oh my god, what's going on? Are the Russians in here trying to start nuclear reactors? What's happening? What they found out is there was actually a high enough concentration, up to 3%, of the right type of uranium in there, and water had leaked in, which basically we use in current day nuclear reactors, as kind of a medium to slow down the neutrons to allow a, a longer neutron cascade and more of that continual nuclear cycle to go through. Since that happened naturally, there was essentially a nuclear reactor going off for the last three billion years in Gabon, West Africa, all on its own, completely natural. This is the organic version of a nuclear <laughs> reactor. You can eat it. You can, it's organic. <laughs> it has been slowly just pushing off heat for the last three billion years in the middle of Africa. Totally wild. I, I, I like to think to myself, what would happen if they had discovered this in 17... 17- 72 as opposed to 1972? How the fuck would they explain it to themselves? Are you sure that they didn't just accidentally bomb yeah, they the put some, place they and put then, the, oh, well, we thought yeah. there was a nuclear power plant. I don't think they're using the depleted uranium against anybody in Gabon, Africa <laughs> in the 1960s. I think I, you don't need that to go through the wicker shields. That's, it's, that's highly strategic. <laughs> yeah. for you don't want to take any chances. So wait, in our hubris, we've been taking responsibility for Godzilla for years saying that oh, we were the nuclear cause of him? Way more likely to be this natural nuclear reactor in Africa. Oh, it's always Africans' fault. You guys are racist. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. And I, of course, am your racist host, comedian archaeologist Robert Timothy. With me is my comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing? Doing great, uh, although don't really hate the Japanese as much anymore now that I know they didn't create Godzilla. So I'm actually become less racist. I don't like the way you evolve. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Let's hear how he feels about black people now. As long yeah. as his hate got transferred to another group, I'm Yeah, I mean, it didn't just disappear. I mean, matter just doesn't... Yeah, di- right. I, I it's just a picked it up and just It went to a different bar graph of hate. <laughs> and, of course, for the second week here, we have our great science comedian host, Mr. Sebastian Tawa. Seb, how are you doing? I'm good. Happy to be back. This is a this is a great honor because uh, one of the few times we get to have another science comedian on the show, and uh, of course, as we've discussed previously, we will fight to the death to see who gets to take that title home. <laughs> well, I thought the first time he didn't. You tried to pigeonhole and threaten him to not be a science right. comedian. He was kind of in the air. Is yeah, that, I would you... call myself more of a like sociological comedian because I mean, sociology is a joke already. Yeah, that's not a science comedian at all. <laughs> You're not even close to a science comedian. I relate. I have been called a sociopathic yeah. comedian. <laughs> I mean, you could have so bumped it up. A little bit and said, like, I don't know, biological comedian. This would have been a halfway point. <laughs> All right, guys, and of course, we are broadcasting live from the Madhouse Comedy Club along the skyline of beautiful downtown San Diego. Come on by, check out Madhouse. In between checking out Madhouse and listening to the Science Faction podcast, if you want to see what's going on with recent science news, go ahead and check out www.thesciencefaction.com for all your latest science news and some witty headlines to go along with it. And while all that's going on, let's head right into science articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. All right, guys, some very interesting articles hit in the science news websites this week. Article number one, gentrifying Africa. Oh, great. That intro really primed us for this one. Yeah. (laughs) 
There's going to be a lot of condos out there. Um, <laughs> really interesting news about our collective ancient history discovered in the genetics of a 4,500-year-old skeleton of Ethiopia. So this is a unique skeleton because it was preserved in really good settings in Ethiopia, making it the first African sample to get ancient DNA from. Before this, all of our ancient sequencing came from much colder regions that tend to preserve DNA intact and better. Like colder, like, come on, baby, give up that DNA. Come on, baby, quit being a prude. Super frigid areas, yeah, that was the point. I just wanted to buy the skeleton a drink. Wouldn't even give me the time of day. So if you think about it, obviously things get preserved better in those Arctic regions. It's hard in tropical regions for DNA to be preserved for too long because it just, it just goes away really quick. It rots away. It's too wet. The date on this skeleton is important because it predates the Eurasian backflow, which was both a less than hygienic sex move and <laughs> an event that happened 3,000 years ago in which a huge amount of people from the Middle East, the Near East, and Turkey all flooded into the Horn of Africa. It is funny, though, because it's a bunch of like lighter-skinned people going into Africa, so they should actually call it the Eurasian Black Flow. <laughs> uh, Wait, was this skeleton mummified, or was it just found in the rock or something? No, I think it was a high-altitude area, so it probably okay. was some slight mummification, but also a lot of uh, anaerobic-type uh, decay, so which preserves things. But not human better. mummification. No, not purposeful, uh, yeah. no. no. Uh, so this backflow was so significant that the migrants made up 30% of the population of the Horn of Africa by the time it was over, which is insane. I mean, think about that. That's a huge displacement of human beings at that time period. Is it like a refugee crisis, like uh, what's going on now? It seems like it, right? We have no idea. The yeah. truth of the matter is, guys, we don't know what caused this huge migration 3,000 years ago among these people, but there's some really interesting little details to this migration. Mammoth rights. <laughs> For instance, the group from the Near East that embarked on this migration were direct descendants from the group that spread farming from the Middle East into Europe a few thousand years before, completely transforming the landscape of Europe from a bunch of hunter-gatherers to farmers, meaning maybe they were essentially the ancient version of real estate developers. Like, all right, we did Europe. That one's we're done. done. Now we're done. Let's try Africa. That's a new frontier, man. We're going to make a lot of cash when we gentrify this place. So wait, they're like flippers? Yeah. Like, uh, they, you know, they go into no neighborhoods, buy shitty caves, mm -hmm. shitty thatch huts, flip them. So they're, they're thinking they brought agriculture to Egypt? Not agriculture, but specific crops that became the mainstays oh, okay. of agriculture in that area. Well, just like current gentrification, do you feel like it started in the gay neighborhoods? Like, into the, they, they, oh my God, was, they're yeah, growing. It was a gay migration over <laughs> to Africa. <laughs> Gays don't like cold neighborhoods. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah it's much faster. You can't wear short shorts. <laughs> it's impractical. Up in the Caucasus Mountains. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> Not only that, but this genetic contribution of these people from the Middle East who once conquered Europe and now have come down and conquered the Horn of Africa didn't just stay in the Horn of Africa, didn't just stay in Eastern Africa. It ended up spreading throughout the continent down to the southern tip of South Africa. We can now find the remnants of the genes from this giant Eurasian backflow migration throughout the entire continent. This is crazy. This is literally a world history changing event that went on about 3,000 years ago that we're only learning about from the DNA. So when do they think that black people lost their pigment, like when they left Africa? Okay, so, I mean, that would be an interesting question. So when do you, when do you lose that amount of pigment? You know, does it happen once? Like, uh, could it, is it possible that it was still black people that came no, in? No, 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 no. Those were lighter-skinned people. But these people, keep in mind, they're not Europeans. These are actually the people who conquered Europeans. Yeah. And if you want to know, hey, who would these people look like? What, do they, what would they look like? If you want to find the lineage of human beings that look the most like them and have the strongest genetic heritage toward them, Sardinians. Oh. That doesn't even sound like a real – that sounds like a Star Trek race. <laughs> Probably because they're, on an, they're right. on an island. They're off on their own, so they didn't get invaded and reinvaded and stuff for so long. So they are, they are literally the, one of the last direct descendants of this group that came out of the Middle East, conquered all of Europe. It's just the mafia. Conquered all – that's it. <laughs> You're thinking of Sicilians. Yeah, but it's an island next to it. <laughs> is it possible this is Europe getting Africa back? Like, you know, like, like hey, the one time they had a bunch of illegals that came over and invaded the Middle East and Europe. We're sending them back. Yeah, we that's don't That's probably what happened. I yeah. mean, we don't know why this happened. Happen, but it's super interesting to see this mass migration and the permanent genetic changes that it brought to world populations. It's even more interesting that it's the same group of people that radically remade Europe only a few thousand years before. And even more significantly, there's no evidence of the group ever returning to their Eurasian homeland, proving the age-old scientific hypothesis that once a subject goes black, there is a rather insignificant chance of them ever going back. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> couple of questions for my panelists. Question number one. Why the big move? What was the motivating factor 
of these Eurasian migrants. I think it goes back to what you were saying. A bunch of guys got tired of skinny white bitches with thin asses. Okay. Wanted to go back to the motherland where asses are ample. I don't remember saying that, but I do think it. So, yeah. Yeah, you can't have skinny white bitches where it's cold. Okay, yeah. So maybe they all decided, hey, we're tired of these Middle Eastern women. They're nagging a lot. We're going to head back south, see how that works out for us. Yeah, Because think... everyone knows black women don't nag. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Ethiopian women don't nag. <laughs> Little food, they're yeah. very satisfied. Yeah. Not much of an ass, though. If you're going yeah. for the ass, stay yeah, away from it. Yeah, I'm not the ass type. Uh, what about you, Seb? Uh, why do you think all these people suddenly migrated to the Horn of Africa 3,000 years ago? I mean, if I were to take a serious guess, I, it would be some sort of weather-related thing. Could or be. Poss- possibly agriculture, for some reason, stopped being good over there, so they had to, to move maybe, out of there. Maybe it was the Jewish exodus. You know, Maybe it was that whole – they got the whole thing wrong. They got the Bible <laughs> geography. They thought they were in Egypt. They were actually in Ethiopia. They thought they were building pyramids. They were actually just building a dude named Fred's house. <laughs> Jews exaggerate. Because let's be honest. By the way, Seb, you don't need to preface your answer with if I'm going to give a serious answer. That's what I do every time. I don't oh. preface it with – Question number two. This one group of people essentially changed the entire Western world, developing farming in the Middle East, using it to reshape Europe, and then infusing agriculture and genetics into the entire continent of Africa. What made this group of people so special and unique? I don't know necessarily the answer to that question, but I think it shows that probably trade was much more common earlier than we thought. At least by some groups, right? Like somebody figured it out. Because if they all went there, there clearly was communication. Right. Maybe it, was, maybe it was, though. Maybe it did have something to do with a giant religious migration, you know, in the same sense that the Mormons all get kicked out to the West at some point, you know, in, in U.S. history. And then we have Utah, which is now this weird remnant of that where we we're like, ah, just go do whatever the fuck you want in the desert. Leave us alone. And then now we have to deal with the remains of that. Maybe it's a similar thing. Maybe they were all like, hey, we're going to start this crazy cult. Let's go do something. And they're like, yeah, just go. Well, if it's based on natural causes, then most likely, they're, oh, the gods don't like us farming here for That's whatever right. reason. That's right. Yeah, well, and then, and then they're like, well, we were right. We were in the Middle East. We really should be farming here. <laughs> what if it was something like all the wild species of Europe, you know, were not nearly as deadly as a species the of Europe. wild species. Like uh, the, you mean the bears. Human being? Oh, okay. The bears, the wild animal, the, the megafauna yeah. of Europe, not as deadly as the megafauna of Africa. Maybe this was just a bunch of dads who didn't want their kids growing up being pussies. Okay. And said, no, you wrestling a badger? Hell no. Wrestling <laughs> I'll, I'll a honey go with badger. A lion instead. Lion I like that. And crocodiles are better. I like that st- <laughs> stiff upper lip dads. That's the reason that they all moved into Africa. As old school and hard ass as your dad might be, this is the original old school hard yeah, ass. Yeah, they were dad. tough back then. Like Red Foreman type. They didn't have ADD back then. <laughs> <laughs> if you had ADD, you just yeah. died. Your father couldn't even drink off his problems at that time. To just eat a bunch of berries that went bad. <laughs> oh, very good, guys. Let's move on to article number two. H I. Wee. It's going to be a big one. <laughs> <laughs> so researchers believe they found a way to fight the HIV virus by sicking bacteria on it. So interesting research. Went through quite a few steps here. I, li- I like this story because it kind of shows the process of science and how they figure something out. But this research indicates that we might have a great new way to prevent HIV infection, which could lead to everyone's ultimate goal to prevent another Bono-centered HIV fundraiser. You so, mean as opposed to just having sex with a virgin? Yeah, you could always have sex with a virgin. That's how you get rid of HIV, of course, in in some old African myths, urban myths. Myths myths sound racist. Wouldn't be urban myths so much as jungle myths. (laughs) (laughs) Wouldn't you pasteurize your semen? Yeah, I think that would I think that would work. <laughs> Except for all the people who like get super into the organic movement and just want that natural unpasteurized. <laughs> That that'd be something you could say to a to an organic. I do not chick. want to sit there and have to explain to my daughter why I'm shoveling down pasteurized semen down her throat. <laughs> I give my kids raw semen. You're a terrible mother. It's artisanal raw semen. Uh, <laughs> so mucosal surfaces such as the lung, gastrointestinal tract, or female reproductive tract are where most infections take place, which makes sense. Those are breaks in your skin. Your skin protects you from those infections. Now, that mucus layer, though, that lays over the actual cells themselves offers some kind of protection from infection. But it's highly varying. Obviously, it's not an impenetrable barrier because we get sexually transmitted diseases and colds and all that kind of stuff, which means it gets through the mucus barrier sometimes, but it doesn't always get through that barrier. So what's the difference? But it's not just that 
I might have one kind of mucus barrier and Damien might have another and they act differently. It's that my mucus barrier might be different now than it is a week from now and protect me differently from, from infection. But on average, who has the better mucus barrier? Okay. People might say, oh, Damien's mucus barrier looks way bigger. And I'm always like, yes, but mine is thicker per length ratio. So it's, <laughs> it's not the size of the mucus barrier. It's the motion in the ocean in the mu- mucus barrier. Yeah, and the, and the girth. <laughs> <laughs> you cocky motherfucker. So uh, take the vagina as an example. Alongside hosting a complex, delicate array of beneficial microbes that help fend off intruders, the serviovaginal mucus, or CVM, also makes it tough for invaders to get to the underlying susceptible cells. But its properties vary significantly, not, again, not just between individuals, but also at different times for the same person. This vaginal mucus, it can be super disease catcher mucus or not at all disease catcher mucus. Scientists were like, okay, we know this now. Let's figure out why it is. Let's figure out what the difference between this is. I think invaders is not a fair term to use. Most of the time, stuff that gets in the vagina was welcomed in there. Well, now this is an well, interesting the political choice, Seb. <laughs> <laughs> Seb doesn't even the believe... The doors were opened voluntarily. She was asleep. Yeah. <laughs> well, if that happened, then... <laughs> Seb, are you That's why I say most of the time. Seb, are you a sick shamer? Are you saying that every time a woman gets sick, she was asking for it? <laughs> No, I'm saying she volunteered and uh, passed out with her shoes on. <laughs> unwisely, all, unwisely opened the gates like a Trojan horse type. If situation. she didn't want to get sick, she shouldn't have dressed like that. She should have assumed <laughs> that this Trojan horse was filled with Romans. With she saw sp- a gift and said, "I want it," without thinking of the consequences. <laughs> so, when scientists went to figure it out, they began by gathering samples of the CVM from 31 different women, which they scrutinized for an array of different properties to see which ones worked well against HIV and which ones didn't. They had to collect the samples in the first place, and they did this by showing the sample groups a series of medical-grade pictures of Patrick Swayze and Patrick Stewart. They got to cover a wide range of tastes. <laughs> they just had a diaper on the chair beneath them, and then they, they just removed all those 100% success ratio in the mucus coming out for that. Oh, does that guy have pancreatic cancer? <laughs> We all know a off. woman gets turned on when she's sitting on a diaper. <laughs> <laughs> Next, they tested CVM capabilities of trapping HIV particles. Which one did well? Which ones did poorly? Then they found what's the difference between the ones that do well and the ones that do poorly. Interesting side note for you guys. There is a scale that clinicians use to assess the overall vaginal health. The name of the scale seems slightly off because it's called the Nugent Scale. After Ted Nugent? That is the only thing I can think of. It seems like the least appropriate name for a scale to gauge vaginal health. Well, Ted Cascar- Nugent's probably got, had a lot of pussy. Yeah, because when I think of vaginal health, I think of an aging rocker shooting animals from a helicopter with a crossbow. Cat Scratch Fever was playing on the radio when we developed the scale. We thought it would be, no one scientist should get the scale. What they found was the problem was levels of a chemical called D-lactic acid which seemed to correlate with the ability of the mucus to trap HIV or not to. And that piqued the researcher's interest because the body doesn't actually make D-lactic acid. So they imagined, oh, there must be some kind of microbe that's in there that's producing this. And they went through and they actually did find the microbe, Lactobacillus crispatus. We meet again. (laughs) (laughs) Which helps it produce a certain amount of that D-lactic acid, which then affects the mucus in shrinking the pores that's between them. So it essentially creates a better barrier that prevents HIV. And so, where does that micro come from? Just like you have different bacteria that's you're in your microbiome, in your flora and fauna, and your gut system and stuff. Women have different bacteria. Oh, so it's a, it's a natural producer. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, but it you know varies in uh, whether or not one person's going to have it or have a lot of it. Fecal so, transplants. Yeah, I, I've been saying this for a long time. There has to be a vaginal microbiome that they're really not doing a lot of studying because we're getting into this whole gut biome and it's becoming a huge part of research. Well, they uh, probably research are now. doing studying, but women don't want people to know what's they really t- in their vaginas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they, they put the scientific <laughs> lockdown on it. They'll put pink in the NFL for breasts, but God forbid they, they do <laughs> what color would be vagina. Pink, they, pink is the vagina color. They stole it. Yeah, it's already pink. Uh, so basically, ladies, the only reason we're getting STDs is because you don't have the right type of bugs in your fun pouch. I think we should start doing it. And I would like to comment, by the way, one of the ways you get a better gut biome, you don't eat probiotics. That stuff barely works. You do fecal transplants where they actually take some feces from one person and put it in the, in the rectum of somebody else. That's how you, you transfer those. If you wanted to do a vaginal transplant. Wait, who the hell does that? It's actually really common now. It's becoming a really big form of disease treatment for you, people with uh, gut diseases. You get on your all fours if next to somebody. If you're in the hospital and you, they have to do it. Not necessarily. It's people with long-term gut issues, people no. with issues with certain foods and stuff. 
stuff they're finding that uh, fecal transplant is actually a really good technique to get to, to fix the problem. Could you do it like a back alley fecal transplant where basically you're just sodomized <laughs> yeah. after somebody who has a really healthy gut? Well, that, that's a that good question, Damien, because you lead right into my other thing, which is the version of the vaginal transplant would just be me having unprotected sex with two women in a row. <laughs> you know, we get the one that we'll go, how do you do against preventing HIV? I do great. Fantastic. Bobby, bang this one. All right. Now when you're done, how about you? I'm not so great, but I don't have HIV yet. Guess what? You're not going to get it. Bobby, give her the, the old one, too. I think I know why they call it the Nugent scale, huh. because in Ted Nugent's biography, and don't ask me why I remember this, but basically he would stack women three high. You know, it's it's nice to pull your car into different garages within the same trip, I guess. So a couple of yeah. questions for my panelists. Number one, how will future bacteria turn out to help the fight against viral infections? In this case, it's producing a chemical that constricts mucus in a vagina to help protect against HIV. That's pretty fucking elaborate. What's the next thing a bacteria or group of bacteria is going to do? to basically help us not get sick from a virus. Better bacterial training. Right now we're just catching the slow viruses, but soon there's going to be the viruses that try to go buy an Acme product, that try to sneak by as a bush. I will... <laughs> right, you mean like the wily coyote yeah. of viruses? <laughs> Two viruses on top of each other's shoulders with a trench coat over the top okay. and a mustache. Yeah, <laughs> disguising itself as a hidden bacteria, yeah. of course. We need bacteria that's seen little rascals, that's uh -huh. seen Looney Tunes, and knows the tricks of the trade. Okay, so you want cartoon-level... Bacteria getting ready to fight the viruses. If I could get a, if I get Bugs Bunny dressed up as a virus to seduce one of them, and it's easy too because you don't actually have to put Bugs Bunny in the vagina. You can actually just put him in the mouth, and then he burrows a little hole, turns right at Albuquerque, and makes it. <laughs> <laughs> Killed a rabbit. <laughs> what about you, Seb? Well, the next thing is they'll start wearing pink socks in support of of breast cancer. And the, that, that'll help. That'll get rid of. Roger Goodell himself does <laughs> yeah. that. Oh, so the, the bacteria will be wearing yes, pink socks. Yes, the bacteria will wear pink socks in solidarity of cervical cancer. I did, like that. Did we agree that pink? Because I think mauve might be a much better color. Yeah. yeah. I, well, I, I like it for a couple of reasons because if I, few people know this. Pink is actually the virus color as well. And when the NFL, when they all wear their pink socks to support, you know, like women's issues or breast cancer and stuff, it's always funny. It would be the same relationship because the bacteria would wear the pink socks. And it's like, yeah, we wear the socks of the group of people we beat the shit out of the most. <laughs> <laughs> One case it's women. The other case it's viruses. <laughs> Either way. Uh, all right, guys, question number two. Using the bacteria to fight viruses is the age-old tactic of bringing in the snake to kill the mice. Once the bacteria gets out of control, what will be the vaginal mongoose that we send in after it? Could be nanobots. Could be gorilla antibodies because we would do a marrow transplant with a gorilla. You need a bigger strike. I imagine okay. I imagine our antibodies are weak by comparison to a gorilla's antibodies. So the bacteria keep us mm. safe from the viruses. They grow out of control. Now we don't know how to fight them. All of a sudden we have to take gorillas' immune systems, which would be undoubtedly much weaker than ours because they don't even live in large complex towns and cities with exposure to germs and stuff. But they have a great bench. Oh, it's true. Better bench press, which assumingly would mean that their white blood cells would be stronger. <laughs> I would assume that, if anything, my blood vessels have a tough time containing uh, – like the cage is not strong enough to contain the antibodies within. First of all, you need to <laughs> so start – So you're just, your blood vessels are just bursting all the time. Exactly. It looks like I'm a hemophiliac. I'm just <laughs> leaking blood out of my eyes. And... It would be great if you stopped getting your zoological information from Gorilla Glue ads. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think I patch up my blood vessels? All right, Seb. What do you think – May, be maybe, the, I have an idea that's maybe a little far-fetched, but what about just keeping it We don't it do far-fetched ears. <laughs> what if you just kept your vagina clean? Just kept it clean. Yeah. You know what? I think it's a lot harder than that. I think we have it real easy as dudes. Oh, we certainly might have it much easier than them. There's like a but, whole cave of weird, moist things going on back there. But there are definitely plenty of women with clean vaginas. Yeah, but Just maybe, ask them, what do you do? And they'll go, maybe we don't spread maybe, our legs off. Weekly pressure washing. Oh, that's not it. <laughs> I know, I'm just kidding. In fact, I bet you the ones that have a lot more sex are probably more into vaginal cleanliness and vaginal hygiene. Probably. They, so gotta, they, they have to present themselves more often. Yeah, they've got like a special shop vac in the yeah. shower just for that. <laughs> Question number three. I think everybody can agree on at least one thing regarding this article. We need to rename the vaginal health scale. <laughs> Would you gentlemen like to lead this cause and give us some suggestions for what we should call it? Oh, you could call it the taint scale. If you're closer <laughs> to the anus, it's no good. <laughs> <laughs> taint to brown scale. <laughs> I taint about to go down there. <laughs> <laughs> this taint happening. I think they should do it like uh, when they do the terrorist alert scale. They should have the same <laughs> color coding scheme. <laughs> so what would be the bad color and the good color? Uh, I would have to look at what the actual terrorist alert scale is. I think red is usually red bad, Red is right? bad for terrorists. Usually is, red is usually bad. 
But I mean, you couldn't tell that just by the outside. But that, like that, a that doesn't fit for a v- vagina. It still would. It would say it would use the same whatever the same category is for it as well. So it's not red. It doesn't say high. It says like severe. <laughs> Vaginal rating severe. <laughs> because it's a mucus, possibly a moisture issue as well. Couldn't you use like the same the same way we classify deserts and rainforest? Couldn't we? Arid. Yeah. Arid to tropical. <laughs> Frigid to tropical. Yeah. <laughs> What's it when a a frozen tundra? Like, what would you? What, what type of woman would get the frozen tundra? Like, es- dry, very unsexual well, Eskimo a, women. Not a, yeah, not a lot of things living in there. That actually sounds uh, like it'd be a pretty healthy vagina because there wouldn't be a whole lot of you know outside things living inside of it. There's not a lot of bushes and plants and trees. Yeah, the place in with the infections is the tropical rainforest. Would be the disease center. Right. <laughs> That's right. It would be. <laughs> Yeah, you know it's bad when the woman walks out of like the testing clinic and the guy's just shaking his head and they're like, "Was it bad?" And they're like, "She's the fucking Amazon." <laughs> <laughs> it's very moist. Uh, that's that's where the term Amazon woman comes from. They were just really dirty, just, dirty it was girls, just, so they ended up having like cast away. You know, like the Spartans did. A lot of funk, not a lot of showers <laughs> in this time. Uh, the women are gonna love this show. All right, <laughs> let's move right on to I call BS. I call. I call. I call. I call. I call. Ring, ring. I call BS. All right, this is I Call BS, where I read four science articles, and my panelists compete to try and see which ones are real and which ones are BS, standing for bad science. Are you guys ready to play? I'm ready to beat a scientist, yeah. I'm ready. I won last time, I believe. Damien is used to getting the shit beat out of him (laughs) in this game. But I get up every time like Rocky. I went the distance. I could have tapped out a question three, but I went the distance with Apollo Creed. Damien would be like Rocky if Rocky never won. Like, just never, like, even came close to winning. It'd be a very uninspiring movie. Yeah, that's that's how I've described your life. Be more realistic. It's like a really uninspiring movie. All right. Uh, Article number one, an 80-plus-year-old science mainstay was recently disproven, leading to the possibility of a whole new battery technology that may replace lithium-ion. Number two, scientists have recently discovered why elephants get more cancer than other animals. Number three, scientists have discovered scandium trifluoride breaks all the rules of matter because it has negative thermal expansion. And article number four, scientists have discovered that it only takes one word for people with normal hearing to distinguish the voice of a close friend or relative amongst other voices. All right, guys, let's go through and see what our panelists think. Go ahead and follow along at home and see if you can beat them. Won't be hard to do that with Damien. All right, guys, an 80-plus-year-old science mainstay was recently disproven, leading to the possibility of a whole new battery technology that may replace lithium-ion batteries. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is both science and the biggest article in Vibrator Monthly. (laughs) (laughs) And Sebastian. Uh, I think you're going to have to be a little more specific. What is the thing that was disproven? You just said something scientific mainstay. Scientific was That's absolutely true. I can't tell you. I'm going to go 50-50 shot and say that it's not true. All right. Article number two. Scientists have recently discovered why elephants get more cancer than other animals. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science because they don't get more cancer than animals because they never forget to have a mammogram. (laughs) (laughs) They are really studious about their health. (laughs) Seb, what do you think? Uh, I think it's bullshit. All They're, right. W- what did they do? Go out and test every animal in the wild? Yeah, of course. That's how you test animals, Seb. How, <laughs> yeah, it does, just, just seems un, not plausible that they actually did that. All right. Article number three. Scientists have discovered scandium trifluoride breaks all the rules of matter because it has negative thermal expansion. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science. I know the reason it can do this is because it gets results, but I don't know how much longer Sergeant Thermodynamics is going to have his badge and gun on his desk soon if he can't button up and fly right. They might have to pair him with a partner that gets things under control. So you're saying because they're breaking the laws of physics, there is essentially an enforcer that's going to come by and make sure this shit gets fixed. This is a loose cannon compound, all right? All the rest of them obey the rules. This one's allowed to get away with it because it gets results. It's the Mel Gibson because and, it's very anti-Semitic. And Seb, what do you think? Uh, I'm going to say... Bad science, but based on the wording of the question. It may be po- true that this this compound has a negative thermal expansion, but nothing breaks the rules of nature. Okay. Uh, by num- definition. Number four. Scientists have discovered that it only takes one word for people with normal hearing to distinguish the voice of a close friend or relative amongst other voices. Damien, do you think this is science or bad science? This is science, but that word is the N-word. 
<laughs> That's the only word it works with. I could, you, <laughs> I could tell if it was my mom, Bobby. A redneck? <laughs> if it's Bobby, it's got a hard R. Yeah. yeah. That's how you know. It's meant to be offensive. <laughs> if it's my mom, it's her trying to talk to me to rap She's one on one. Yeah. <laughs> Man, wouldn't it be sad if that was the only word you could tell, and then you had to have people yell that word in crowded areas in order to find them? That's what you tell your kids to yell if you're yeah. lost. <laughs> I'm picturing more of a ransom phone call. Like, I need proof of life. Tell me my son's alive. <laughs> Fine, but you could only say one word. <laughs> yeah, that was my son. I'm offended That's... wildly. <laughs> That's a fa- also, he's given me a lot of information about who took him. Not that yeah. I needed to know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Colombians. All right, and Sam, uh, what you got? Oh, it just seems perfectly plausible. All righty. And let's go back and see how they did and see how you did at home. Article number one, an 80-plus-year-old scientific mainstay was recently disproven, leading to the possibility of a whole new battery technology that may replace lithium-ion... Damien thought this was true, Seb thought this was false, and this one was science. Suck it, scientist. So it has to do with potassium ion batteries, and they overturned an 80-plus-year-old scientific dogma that stood for decades by showing that potassium can actually work with graphite in a potassium ion battery, a discovery that could pose a challenge and sustainable alternative to widely used lithium ion batteries. So what was the dogma that you couldn't use carbon and... Right, they did not think potassium potassium would react with graphite in this type of manner. There was a 1932 paper that explicitly said, oh, we tried all these experiments, it didn't work. So everybody just kind of gave up. They were like, okay, well, we don't need to verify. We'll just leave that. Kept going. And then just recently, somebody tried it. And they're like, oh, shit, this idiot was wrong. Like, of course, they were. it was the 30s. Look at the shitty cars they were making. Of course, they were wrong. <laughs> or they just drop a piece of banana by accident on, on their graphene sample. And like, hey, look, it's powering my something. And he's but like, I, my muscle cramp is gone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> very, very interesting. One of the reasons this is important, you brought up the idea lithium ion works really well. It does work really well. Lithium is a very rare resource. We're already running out of it. It's one of the things where economies of scale usually make that cheaper when you make more. It actually makes it more expensive with lithium because there's a little of it left. And it's really hard to get at. It's very difficult to recycle. So lithium isn't the greatest option for us. Why don't they just make a little big bang in the laboratory and create a bunch of lithium? They could do that. They could actually create the, a whole new universe in a laboratory. Seems. They could have YouTube. We even talked about it. The Just Mormons aren't using scientists. it. Yeah. Totally <laughs> the lazy. Mormons know how to do it. As opposed, gets a planet this way. <laughs> as opposed to potassium, which is like a thousand times more prevalent, and it, the batteries won't be as good as lithium ion, but we think with some work we can get them pretty close, and with their ease of use, ease of recycle, everything like that, this would be a much better option for us. So maybe you still use lithium ion for things like your phone that need specifically to be smaller and everything. But things like electric cars a 20% increase in the actual um, size of the battery compared to a I don't, 75% decrease in cost would be very significant. Or, or like he said, I mean, it'd be better for vibrators. Then you have an excuse. We need a bigger battery. It needs it's to be not, bigger. It's just I need a, the battery's size. Uh, I don't even like girthy vibrators. <laughs> yeah. I don't. Uh, but, you know, if this is the only way they can make one that, that saves Earth, then I'm on board. <laughs> this isn't like mucous membranes. We're looking for girth here. <laughs> Article number two, scientists have recently discovered why elephants get more cancer than other animals. Both of you thought this one was false, and this one was bad science. Mm. Elephants get way less cancer than they should for their size, and scientists have just found out why. The results show that elephants have extra copies of a gene encoding for a tumor suppressor, P53. Further, elephants may have a more robust mechanism for killing damaged cells at risk for becoming cancerous. The findings suggest extra P53 could explain elephants' enhanced cancer resistance. You've got to think of cancer as a statistical chance. Every cell in your body has a statistical chance of becoming cancerous. Something like an elephant has a lot of cells in their body, statistically has a huge chance of getting cancer over its lifetime. They weren't sure why they don't have elephants real with cancer all the time. Turns out that animals that size have these natural defenses like excess tumor suppressors to keep that from happening because otherwise they'd all fucking die of cancer by the time they were 10. Aren't big animals more efficient with energy too than small animals? Like because, an elephant is more efficient with energy yeah. than a mouse. Well, it certainly, ho- it certainly is more efficient when, it, when you t- think about heating and stuff. But they need – the bigger the animal, the less energy it needs per mass. I guess like that makes sense. energy it needs to consume per mass. Plus, they're terrified of mice. I mean, maybe because they, they, right. they see how much they eat by scale. It's like, oh, if I ate that much, I'd be a 17-ton elephant as opposed to a svelte 15-ton elephant. Article number three. Mean and mean. <laughs> Article number three. Scientists have discovered scandium trifluoride breaks all the rules of matter because it has negative thermal f- expansion. Damien thought this was true. Sebastian thought this one was false. And this one is 
Science. I know Seb didn't like my wording on that. It's a fair enough fault because of your wording. Fair, fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough justification. But most materials swell when they warm and shrink when they cool. But UConn physicist Jason Hancock has been investigating a substance that responds in reverse. It shrinks when it's warm. Not only does scandium trifluoride drastically shrink as it warms over a huge range of temperature, it also keeps the same stable cubic crystal structure over an even larger temperature range from absolute zero to 1,800 Kelvin, which is 2,700 Fahrenheit. Have we reached absolute zero? Do we know for certain that we can, in absolute yeah, zero? We don't know we for can sure. Get just we just above know it. very close. Right. <laughs> and it doesn't melt till it gets to that high thing, almost 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit. That's really rare. It keeps the exact same shape the entire time and throughout the same state of matter throughout that entire temperature range. Because very it's few. A, it's crystal. Yeah. The crystal structure. And very few materials can boast being so stable and most having some kind of phase change during which their atoms shift positions, at least once during that warming period. So this is a really interesting material. I've heard some people on some online discussion forums bring up some interesting ideas on energy generation using this. We always knew that certain things expanded when they got heated up. We didn't know that other things could shrink when they heat up. That would actually allow you to do things mechanically that would be very energy efficient if the same environmental conditions would cause one thing to shrink and one thing to grow you can actually use that to power things and push things around and do some really interesting stuff so there's some there's some interesting possibilities of this that go well beyond like eccentric chemistry and stuff like that can't wait to see what vibrator monthly has to say about this <laughs> and lastly they won't be using that material <laughs> Lastly, scientists have discovered that it only takes one word for people with normal hearing to distinguish the voice of a close friend or relative amongst other voices. Both of you guys thought this one was true, and this one is bad science. The study actually shows it takes two words. The study involved playing recordings to Canadian French speakers who were asked to recognize... Oh, wait, oh, okay, I call bullshit <laughs> right away. <laughs> Nobody understands what those people say. They That's sound like right. ducks. <laughs> That's right. They were asked to recognize on multiple trials which of the 10 male voices they heard was familiar to them. Merci beaucoup turned out to be all they had to hear, though some caution should be used before extrapolating too much as the study focused on French Canadians and as such has to be repeated in human populations. <laughs> 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 Interesting because uh, that actually, in uh, in most cases, is much better than even the best voice recognition software, which needs sometimes 10, 12, 13 words for the best stuff yeah. to catch you. So in a way, that's one of those things our human brain can do much better than a computer at the current state. There's a lot of things it can do better. There is, but I would, I would have thought, if you told me with the state of current sound dynamics and our ability to analyze sound and sound waves and stuff, I would be like, oh, you need half a syllable to guess who's saying it. Turns out, no. It turns out our ears our brain is better than the most advanced computer doing this exact work so very very cool stuff congratulations to damien who technically won technically was there a red flag thrown and you're going to go review the previous there was answer? an asterisk on the the thermal one there was an asterisk listen as a rule laws of nature aren't meant to be broken like <laughs> yeah. that seb can beat me more than 50 percent of the time <laughs> that is a law of nature and as a rule just generally not going to be broke. All right, guys. Good job. Let's head right on into Hey Science, Listen Up. Hey Science, Listen Up. All right, guys. Hey Science, Listen Up, where our comedian, Damien Mercado, spouts off about some ridiculous, unscientific claim and tries to tell a bunch of much more educated people how things should be. Word for word, that was the abstract when I was proposing this bit. Yeah. They probably just read exactly what That's I proposed That's exactly to him. it is. I meant, what do you mean? These conspiracy theories, well, I'm the only one here fighting for the truth. You two scientists with your careful observation and careful recording. I'm surprised you would call them conspiracy theories. One would think you'd have a name, like truth theories for them. <laughs> well, unfortunately, big call science. Own theories, conspiracy theories. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we chose our name well. Uh, you're not going to talk me out of it. A lot of us are contrarians. We like to seem on the border, on the fringe of things. Welcome to Hey Science, Listen Up. Where science and fancy big city book learning take a back seat to the truther, me. Not to be confused with the truth. The truth is a rapper, I'm not yeah. that guy. <laughs> Last week I opened your eyes to the new world order. This week, Bobby, Seb, and the rest of the sheeple are going to learn about the new world order's most recent power move, 9-11. That was the most recent? They'd... <laughs> They've been off for a while. Yeah. They're on a sabbatical. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, the lizard people do things. You don't confuse. This is the new world order. There are a lot of people focusing on our on, on our attention. We're a really press, procrastinating organization. We really hit about every 15, 20 years. <laughs> Took that long just to teach Middle Eastern people to fly a plane into a building. I mean, it's 
They, they, they really think they know it all. Inshallah. Get him to show up at a place on time. Right. If you're one of the unenlightened that believes the official story, and by the way, I hope I said that condescendingly enough, consider this segment the most important mind-blowing science or comedy segment on a podcast that you hear today. The official story states that four passenger airliners, which all departed from airports on the U.S. East Coast bound for California, were hijacked by 19 al-Qaeda terrorists to be flown into buildings. Two of the planes, American Airlines Flight 11 and United Airlines Flight 175, were crashed into the north and south towers of the World Trade Center complex in New York. Conspiracy theories about this day range from planes hitting the buildings but were toppled by bombs to the no-plane theory, which states that either satellites or just good old-fashioned bombs toppled the tower. From it being orchestrated by the Illuminati, the NWO, Wall Street, or even a comedy science podcast host named Bobby. There's a lot of theories about me causing 9-11. We were in high school together, and I was still my main. How did he do it? As we discussed last week, due to the everybody wins nature of the conspiracy theorists, or real skeptics as we like to be called, everybody's right. However, I know that you two naysayers will have something to say, so I wrote down some deep and thought-provoking questions that will hopefully open your eyes. Question number one. 9-11 was a complex, coordinated attack that changed the direction of this nation and led to several wars and the current police state that we now know. Assume that this was all done simply to justify the TSA. Why is the TSA so important to the shadow government's plan to control us all? Well, one of the reasons is that human beings get most of their uppityness, like most of their ability to fight government, to rebel against those who are holding them down, to to like fight the power. All of that comes from shoes. So if you can get a person out (laughs) of their shoes, they're so vulnerable when you're out of your shoes. You can't run anywhere if there's glass on the ground. And unless you're in Die Hard, you're not going over that shit. You're stuck, you know? (laughs) Your feet, you feel dirty, so you're already being degraded as well. And like, you try a front kick without shoes, see how well that goes, you know? (laughs) Nobody feels like a person if they're carrying less than five ounces of liquid (laughs) i think it was just to kind of demean us to bring us down to keep us as a as a group of people more oppressed so you're saying that uh, because our collective confidence is so low Mm -hmm. because we're walking around shoeless yeah well think about inside an asian house or something so you're a gunman you're about to open fire in the airport you have to go through there you have to take your shoes off you lose all your power the second your shoes are gone you could have three ak-47s it doesn't matter if you don't have your loafers on you're gonna gonna slip and fall yeah sure no Automatically, my escape route's changing. I'm going to avoid all escalators. That's yeah. just a horror show waiting to happen. Oh, man. Yeah, and could you, could you imagine in the middle of a shooting spree getting a stub toe? That would be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm convinced. You know what? You might be more real skeptic than you think. Yeah. Well, I think it's probably just like a, to boost our self-confidence. You know how like teenage girls, when their self-confidence is low, they'll, t- they'll show revealing pictures of themselves on Facebook. So mm-hmm. if your confidence is low, you go to the TSA and they get to see you naked and then you feel good about yourself. Oh, that's an interesting one. Yeah. I, I have frequently thought to myself, like, I wonder how many dudes in the back room are jerking off to me right now when I'm going through that <laughs> micrometer scanner. In the I- back room? They just do it right there. <laughs> Do you think the biggest compliment is like when a sexy male TSA agent goes, I got this one? Like, <laughs> maybe you or perhaps an attractive blonde, whatever. I was reading about this guy who uh, had the curse of having like the world's biggest penis. He's a Mexican dude, and uh, he was like 18 something inches flaccid. And, and he was talking about how it was horrible to go through security and stuff. And I would just think, like, yeah, every single time they would see that thing and be like, oh, he's, he's got a kilo of coke <laughs> you know? and rolled up into a salami type shape in there. <laughs> We got to go get that. There would be a lot of like unintentional dick grabbing. How many times though has that yeah. dick grab resulted in a hey? Yeah. Oh, hey, what's this? Do you think horses in estrus look at him like? Yeah, like, I actually think most women would be like, hey, what's the-? actually no, no, no. Yeah, he can't have sex with anyone. Yeah, no. but only the butt. <laughs> We're talking about conspiracies. Quit trying to throw me off track with your wild butt talk, Bobby. I'm here to get to the truth. I'm sorry. Question number two. There may be something said for extreme government surveillance and citizen vigilance, the type that has come in the wake of 9-11. So my question is this. It's two parts. Could S.H.I.E.L.D. have prevented 9-11? And which New York-based super team was best equipped to save us? Okay, question. S.H.I.E.L.D. with with Samuel L. Jackson Nick Fury or S.H.I.E.L.D. with white Nick Fury? I don't see the difference. Well... (laughs) Let's just say credit score factors in. (laughs) Samuel L. Jackson, Nick Fury. Okay. This is delicate. Uh, It's not that he couldn't do it. It's not that they couldn't do it with him as their leader. It's just that it's hard to win the battle set for 12 o'clock when you show up at 1230. That's that's all I got to say. You wouldn't show up on time. 
How many people thought Nick Fury only got promoted because he was black? Oh, well? yeah. I mean, yeah. was there a white Nick Fury out there who could have done the job better? Literally, the there was. <laughs> there was literally a white Nick Fury. <laughs> who already existed in, yeah. the, in the previous universe. Played by David Hasselhoff in the Nick Fury movie in the 90s. He, and David Hasselhoff would show up right on time yeah. with a name like that. He's He doesn't have a choice. Kit <laughs> he's just, German. Yeah, he's Kit German. just takes him Very there on punctual. time. <laughs> Kit won't let him be late. <laughs> Imagine you're Samuel L. Jackson. You know, you're one of the biggest actors in Hollywood. You're getting set for this billion-dollar Marvel movie. Sorry. David Hasselhoff's taking your spot. He showed up on time. I'm sorry. You could play a Jedi Master. Uh, Mr. Jackson, you're 60 years old. You should know. I know you look 40. You look great. But You know what would be great is if you were on set with David Hasselhoff on the rare instance where he was running late as he was running from his car to the thing. If you just played the opening theme to Baywatch as he was running in. <laughs> He's still not wearing a shirt. Yeah. <laughs> and where did he get the buoy? <laughs> <laughs> all right, but uh, which New York-based super team? Assuming that a uh, if you think a Spider-Man could have done this mm-hmm. all on his own, by all means. But residing within the state of New York. Oh, that's a good one. Okay, I am going to go the New Mutants back when they had Cypher, the greatest of the mutants. So you're choosing... Cypher, Cypher, a mutant whose power it is to just learn languages very quickly. He can learn languages very quickly. Helps a lot in combat situations. Cypher. Are they fighting computer hackers? No, 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 no. But I just think that, obviously, with Cypher, they'd be able to win. Without him, probably a coin toss. It'd have to be a group of women that show a lot of skin. Because that would distract a bunch of hardcore Muslims. By the way, Cypher actually would have stopped 9-11, if you think about it. Because the whole reason that they were able to pull it off is because you couldn't interrogate them well. Like, the guy, they just walked through security, and they're like, hey, what's going on? Uh, nothing, nothing. Cypher goes up to them, starts speaking in perfectly fluent Arabic, can notice the tone of their Arabic, and know that they're Saudi, and, uh, you know, starts putting two and two together. He stops 9-11. So every Saudi person I see from henceforth, I need to assume, is plotting in 9-11. You know what? Yeah, what were you doing since 9-11? No, every Iraqi. <laughs> Clearly, the Saudis are our friends. We have all the deals with them. Uh, Seb is speaking some sense here. <laughs> See, all right. I thought my time in Iraq was misspent, but now I realized they all got what they deserved. <laughs> my ear necklace is justified. Question number three. Us real skeptics like to make claims like aluminum planes can't penetrate the steel structure of the World Trade Center or jet fuel can't burn steel. We readily find these facts online and report them to other like-minded skeptics. The internet used to be a fun, friendly, pornographic Easter egg hunt. So my question is this. Should the internet be regulated? Should the internet be for everybody? Wait, so the, you want us to regulate the internet to keep people like you from talking about jet fuel burning steel in 9-11? I want to know if the authoritarians, if the fascists in the science community who are uh-huh. so afraid of the truth are going to shut down the internet invented by Al Gore to keep us from spreading our okay. truthers okay. Uh, logic. Here's what I would say. Uh, number one, we don't need to shut down the internet because I've already thought of this. Why would we shut down the internet? We all love the internet. We're normal people. We're not going to ruin it because you guys are assholes. Uh, what about this? What if we start a conspiracy theory about using the internet? Like every time you use the internet, uh, the CIA gets into your balls. Like I don't, it's <laughs> something. Then you'd have a bunch of guys like him with like aluminum around his balls right. every time he's he's looking at porn. Right, and what a better <laughs> tell. <aluminum> God piece. <laughs> yeah. What a great tell of like, oh, great, we don't need to talk to that guy. <laughs> you know what? And then if you, you could pick them out in public if you said the same thing could happen in Wi-Fi. You just listen to guys who sound like they have tinfoil in their underwear walking around. <laughs> guys, I got it. We already talked about depleted uranium, right? And it being a thing. <laughs> what if we convince them to wear you depleted uranium cod pieces to protect their balls, not realizing that they're slightly irradiating their balls, thereby preventing them from having children? All of a sudden, we solve the conspiracy theory thing. They actually want that. Develop- say, hey, I don't need a condom, baby. I got uranium balls. <laughs> For the first time, these guys were fuckable. Because that was the one thing keeping them from getting yeah. late. I don't want to accidentally spawn with this creature. Uranium balls sounds like an intricate mocking name for the nerd in high school. <laughs> hey, uranium balls, why don't you come over here with your four-eyed glasses? And your, that young uranium balls grew up to be Spider-Man's greatest nemesis. <laughs> Uh, I like the idea that scientists would shut down the internet in order to keep conspiracy theorists from talking when the internet 
promote science much more than like sure there's a lot of conspiracy theories on the internet and stuff but what the internet has done for science and scientists is infinitely greater because we actually achieve shit with it you know we email results back and forth we can i can look at the most the most recent published results the second they come out scientists from around the world are all exposed to this vast wealth of peer-reviewed published literature so no matter what the conspiracy theorists do with the internet you motherfuckers got shit on science couldn't you argue that the internet's worked well for us I mean, it it's has. You guys. Oh yeah. You can spread sure. bad information. Yeah. Well, I mean, are quickly. we spreading bad information, or are we just so close to the truth that you guys just get defensive? It's like calling an alcoholic an alcoholic. You know, I'm saying science hey, I'm is alcoholic. bullshit. Right. As the guy who just won a science competition against you, you should really respect <laughs> my opinion on this subject a little bit more. All I know is I wish, uh, regardless of whether it was a conspiracy or not, that Mark Wahlberg was indeed there in first class, so he could have done what he said he would do. I don't know if the rest of you have heard this, but if not, go look up Mark Wahlberg's comments on 9-11. I think he was... Oh, he said he would have saved the day if he was in the plane? Basically? I think he was either scheduled to be on a plane or something happened, and uh, uh, he wasn't there, but he said if he would have, over the radio, you just would have heard a lot of screaming and commotion, and then you would have heard Mark Wahlberg's voice come over saying, we got to find a way to land this plane. <laughs> <laughs> Seth MacFarlane was going to be on there as well. But... Yes. He probably would have. I mean, he probably would have been the most hilarious death of all the deaths. Yeah, that would have been the all funniest the, one. The tragic deaths. But he would have had to quit would have, just would have right before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was, and and by the way, he would have been the one making jokes the entire time because he would be making this like dry, witty, sarcastic humor that the Saudi terrorists wouldn't get. Like they probably like, would have saved the day because they'd be so distracted. Shut yeah. up, you infidel. Well, yeah, right. But think about it. They're all sitting there and they're like, uh, "You stay there." And he's like, "Yeah," because listening to Arab terrorists have never gone wrong. And like they'd be like, <laughs> "Yes." This is true. Listen to this guy. <laughs> He's like, yeah, this seems like it's going to be a great flight. But, I mean, yes, we're all going to heaven. So this guy knows what he's talking about. <laughs> yes, the lack of Jews in our society has meant that we do not understand sarcasm at all. Yes. <laughs> Uh, very, very good. Uh, thank you, Damien, for Hey Science Listen Up. Thank you, Seb, for coming out and being our scientist for, for the again. day. Always, always good. Thank you, audience, for coming out and listening to Science Faction 92. I want to remind you to go to our website, subscribe on iTunes to let us know that you're listening, and please come on back next week for Science Faction 93. You don't have the right type of bugs in your fun pouch. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs>